Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well this morning, and welcome to this morning's quarantine devotionals for Friday, June the 19th, 2020. I hope that your day is as beautiful as it is here in uh, northwestern Washington, um, wherever you're joining us from. I see uh, Ben Lozano, Ben and Janet Lozano, good morning, and Sandy Reed. It is a beautiful morning indeed, Sandy, isn't it? And uh, of course, we'll see if some others join us here, but it doesn't matter because where God says wherever two or three are gathered, he's there also. And well, we may not be physically gathered, but we are sitting here gathered in front of this computer this morning. So uh, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we come to this time of morning devotions. Um, we want our lives to be devoted to him and we want to be a blessing to him. Good morning, Barb, as you join us too. So let's go to our great God in prayer. And he is a great God. And we have to remember that. Lord God, we want to uh, we want to be a blessing to you. But sometimes we find it increasingly difficult in this world when we look at everything around us that's happening. God, we confess that it creeps in and it has a way of displacing you from the throne in our hearts. Lord, we are humans, and as humans, we, we were created to mirror your image. We were created to reflect the joy and the hope and the right judgment that is in you through us. It's part of what we're to do in this world, Lord, create order in a world that would be filled otherwise with chaos. But Lord, we... Um, we do have a difficult time sometimes. I know that there are those who are listening this morning who have difficulty maybe because of health reasons, maybe because of financial reasons, maybe because of family reasons, but if none of those things, Lord, because of the things that are just happening around us and we become distracted and we become discouraged and it stunts our ministry, Lord. It's not what you want us to do, to go into the world and make disciples, preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel with others. So God, we want to pray that during this time of devotions this morning, that you would <clears throat> just give us pause. And I want us to start with a psalm this morning, Lord, that helps us to remember that you are on your throne. And then no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in our lives, that you are still king and everything is going according to your plan, not someone else's, but yours. We pray that you would just reign in our hearts and in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we need to pray that prayer because, you know, as time goes on, especially in this crazy year of 2020, um, there are so many things, guys, and I don't need to tell you this, but there are so many things that are discouraging as we look at them from a Christian perspective. And as Christians, we need to be very careful. We need to be careful because we can get just as caught up in some of these things that are going on as other people. Uh, and from a Christian perspective, we say, well, I'm coming at this from a Christian perspective, but in truth, we uh, are allowing God to be subtly unseated from, from his throne, to think that things are spinning so far out of control that we may not say this in words, but we start to actually think it and act like it that uh, it's even out of God's control. Listen, it's not. I want to read to you from Psalm chapter 2. I want to try and keep this devotional 30 minutes or, or under, but, uh, but I do want to spend some time thinking about this because this has been, from a Christian perspective, kind of a discouraging week as we look at the world. With the, in the United States, the Supreme Court ruling on, uh, on uh, the LGBTQ issues, which was kind of surprising. Um, from even some of the uh, conservative justices there um, uh, with some of the DACA rulings, which kind of, that's more political. Uh, 
Um, but again, kind of discouraging um, with uh, with all the stuff that's going on with the protests and Black Lives Matter, which really isn't that whole movement. It may have started about being about the importance of Black people's lives, which I would laud and agree with, but that movement is not about that anymore. It is a worldview in its own right. Um, but, you know, I, I want to urge you not to be discouraged because listen to what Psalm 2 says. Why do the nations rebel and the people's plot in vain? That's what we're seeing, isn't it? We're seeing people's plot in vain. These Some of these good things turn into messes, you know, they get turned around and people plot in vain against, use it to plot in vain against God. Why do the nations rebel and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against God. Yahweh and his anointed one. Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. And this is what the nations say about God, our God and the Bible. But verse four, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then, then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I've consecrated my king on Zion, my holy mountain. You know, we need to remember this, guys, that God still is enthroned in heaven. He has not been unseated. Nothing of his has been unseated. And I say again that everything that happens in this world, no matter how messy it seems, and this is hard for us to comprehend sometimes, is exactly the way God wants it to be right now. Now, we know it may not be according to his revealed will and scripture for our lives, but in terms of his sovereignty and his working out things in this world, everything that you see going on is exactly where God wants it right now. And you are where God wants you right now in terms of keeping you in the faith. Remember that because God is in control. And even though we need you and I need to speak more to people about Jesus, it's, it's partly our fault that, it largely our fault that things are the way they are because we have not been faithful in evangelism and we need to be more faithful in that. If we want to see this culture and lives change, we need to share the gospel. The gospel is the only answer to what's going on. We need to speak up, speak God's truth into, uh, um, into people's hearts through, uh, when, and uh, by that I mean the gospel, but not only that, speak up for right and wrong. And I know that there's this this thing going on in evangelicalism right now about social justice and not speaking about it, uh, uh, headed up by this Dallas statement on, on uh, social justice, which I think is a bunch of garbage and hogwash, um, even though some of the framers are really good guys. But guys, we need to speak truth into every situation, whether it be racial issues, whether it be abortion issues, whether it be uh, LGBTQ issues, whether it be political issues, God makes us a voice and our efforts, we know that eventually before the Lord returns, they will be thrown into upheaval, but we need to be doing it with the confidence that God is on his throne and he's put us into this world to be salt and light. But don't be discouraged. Just keep doing what God wants you to do. Well, with that being said, and remembering that God is on his throne and that ultimately the Lord ridicules them, let's, uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 5 this morning. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, because that's where we want to put our focus this morning um, as we come to this time of devotions. Uh, let's see who else is tuned in here. Mom and Dad and the Urbanis. Great good to see you, Steve and Steve McIntyre and Carol and Lake. Guys, it's so great to be with you all this morning. As you're turning to Luke chapter 6, um, like I always do, I make some kind of recommendation on Wednesday and Friday for something that I think is a great resource. And this week, um, I don't want to point you so much to a book. I want to point you to something that's online, something that you can actually get on your smartphone or you can get on your computer. You can even get it on Alexa, I think, if you have Alexa in your home. And that is a uh, an app or a website that is called um, uh, that is called refnet.fm. 
refnet.fm. And let me see, Carolyn, you can't call me in the middle of this, <laughs> but uh, um, let me see if I can, uh, oh, I can't share the screen, but refnet.fm. If you go to your smartphone, go to, I, I'd like, if you have your smartphone with you right now, I, I'd urge you to go to your Google Play Store. If it's an Android phone or if it's an Apple phone, go to your Apple Store right now and type in refnet. Do a search for that and put this on your phone. This is a 24-hour internet radio station, and it is the best uh, um, uh, feed of sermons and Bible teaching that I really think has ever been put together in history. Uh, Paul Urbani, who's with us this morning, she recommended this to me, and you will not be disappointed. The world's best Bible teachers are, are uh, on refnet.fm or your refnet app. Um, so take advantage of that, guys, because uh, this is just a great resource. And if we miss out on it, then, then we're missing out on some great teaching. Refnet.fm. All right. You have your Bibles op open to Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. Thanks, Mom and Dad, for posting that on there. They did put the link up there. So click on that link that you see in, in that uh, feed um, uh, that my parents put up. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. Let's read it together. On a Sabbath, he, that's Jesus, passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain. Remember, on a Sabbath, they were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the sacred bread, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. He even gave some to those who were with him. Then he told them, then Jesus told them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Hmm. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that as we come to this text this morning, that you would help us to glean from it what you would have us glean. Help us to understand what the whole point of religion in our lives is, especially when it comes to true religion, which you are the Lord of, Lord. Um, we pray that we would not fall into the same traps that many fall into, many of those that we would view as our opposers fall into. But let us live in righteousness, let us live with Jesus at the center, and let us live in a way that glorifies and points to him, points others to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we come to this text this morning, we meet, we're once again seeing these, uh, these Pharisees, and oh boy, you know, uh, I think sometimes we misunderstand the Pharisees. We think that these guys were just looking to make trouble. The fact of the matter is, is that these were guys who uh, if you're watching that series, The Chosen, that we recommended a few years back, I can't recommend that enough. That's a great series. Um, uh, you can find that on The Chosen website. But we start to see that the Pharisees, um, they were guys who actually operated out of what we would view as more noble motives. They weren't just a bunch of troublemakers. They were really trying to uh, convey um, a true religion. They were people who were trying to uh, uh, make God happy, although they didn't know how, and they really misunderstood the whole point of what true religion is actually about. You know, in we talked a little bit before before this just about some of the movements that are happening out there. Uh, Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ stuff, um, uh, the, the stuff that's happening on Capitol Hill, that has almost become a religion. But in each of these movements, in each of these uh, worldviews, or, or they, they really are more than, than just movements. They, they, they become worldviews. They become things that give people meaning and purpose. That's what is going on. There are, there are things that people are attaching themselves to that they are trying to find purpose, that they're trying to find meaning in, that they're trying to find self-definition in. And in essence, they have become uh, more than movements. They've become more than just uh, something you get behind. They have, in many ways, become religions. Veganism, maybe, it can be like that, too. There's all kinds of things that can be 
like that, environmentalism, you name it. Um, and they are ways that as humans, we try to connect with something greater than ourselves. God has put this kind of longing in us. But the problem is, is that as human beings, we have missed the point of true religion. We're trying to connect with something in the wrong way to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps so that we can achieve some kind of purpose or goal. Well, the same is true when it comes to um, when it comes to what we would see as actual religion, not just movements, but actual religion. And we see that in the lives of the Pharisees here when it came to their religion. Here were people of the Jewish, cult, Jewish culture who had inherited quite a legacy from the living God. Um, they had inherited the entire Old Testament that really points to him, but they missed the point of true religion. You know, we look at Judaism and we say that this is uh, the religion that, uh, um, uh, that really gives kind of the meaning and context to Christianity. But Judaism proper, as we know it today and as it was taught back then, it is not the true religion. It's, it misses the whole point of what God is all about. Christianity and Judaism understood properly, which really isn't Judaism at all, that is true religion. But these Pharisees missed the point of true religion as they adhered to this Judaism that uh, they were a part of. We need to understand, as we look at verses 1 and 2 in our text this morning, look at verses 1 and 2, that religion is God's most basic gift. But it's more than just a gift. Religion really uh, encompasses everything that we do. It guides everything that we do. Uh, in our lives. It is our uh, foundational grid through which we interpret all of reality, and it is the grid by which we set the standards for our lives. It is God's most basic gift, but as human beings, as sinful human beings, it has become a distorted mess for many of us, and it certainly had become a distorted mess for these Pharisees. We need to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap. You know, we look at these Pharisees and we see how at home they were in their religion. And we can make the same mistake. If you're a Christian here uh, listening this morning and you've been in church for any length of time, we need to be careful that we don't become the same kind of at home in our religion that these Pharisees were in their religion. So sometimes those who are most at home in the church can also be the most critical people in the church. And if you, again, if you've been in church any length of time, you may have seen this. You may need to look in the mirror and actually see this in yourself. I pray that's not the case. And none of you that I know on here this morning do I see that in. But we still need to be careful because the longer that we spend time in church, the more comfortable we can become and the more critical that we can sometimes become of what God is doing in the church. Sometimes being comfortable in the church, comfortable in the religion, even if it is, is under the guise of Christianity, uh, sometimes it can lead to an assumed spirituality in us, thinking that we're connected with God when we're not really. We can sometimes be at home, as just as at home in our religion as we are in the world. Sometimes we can even think that we own, for lack of a better word, almost own this religion when we've completely lost touch with the God who established it. And we need to be careful of that. You know, we need to examine our attitudes over and against those of these religious leaders. We need to ask the question, when it comes to church, when it comes to our Christianity, are we too comfortable? Are we as at home within those church walls as we might be in the world? Do we think we have some kind of claim to the church that we go to that we don't really have? You know, I've seen this in church. I've actually seen believers come and <laughs> into the service and dislodge someone who's never been there before from their seat because that's the seat they sit in. <laughs> now, I know that may sound like a joke. You know, the United Church that I grew up in, mom and dad, you remember those United Churches? Uh, churches sometimes churches, they'll even put a little plaque. Uh, somebody's donated money towards seats in a church or a pew in a church. And you know what? That's their pew. Well, we, not, we may not be that extreme, but we may have other ways of doing that in the church. You know, the, fa the, the, the message never changes. 
the message is always Christ. It's always the gospel, but sometimes the way that that is conveyed in church or the methodologies by which we reach the world, those things do change. The message doesn't, but the methodologies may change. And just because it's not the way that we're used to it or the way that we've always done it, or it doesn't fit inside of our box uh, that we've kind of established over the years of going to church, over the years that we've began we, be, uh, being a Christian, doesn't mean that uh, God's not operating there. We need to be careful to not be like these Pharisees. God was clearly operating in Jesus Christ. I mean, this is Jesus that they're, that they're criticizing. And they're thinking that that what he's doing isn't true religion. Good grief. Can you imagine the audacity? Uh, uh, well, you know what? We don't have to um, uh, work hard to imagine it because sometimes I think we can see it right in our own lives if we, com if we compare ourselves with these religious leaders. You know, we need to be careful that we're not so comfortable in our religion, that we're not so comfortable in there in these church walls that we miss the whole point of why God has brought us there in the first put, first place. And not only when it comes to the church, but even other people's uh, experiences as Christians. We see new believers, and you know what? God may be greatly at work in their lives, or somebody new comes to the church, and you know, uh, they do things a little bit differently, or, or maybe they influence some in the church to do things a little bit differently, but it's still pointing toward Christ and it's still the gospel. We're also not the gatekeepers of others' faith. Now, praise God, mature Christians are put in the lives of younger Christians to guide them and uh, and, and, and to uh, keep them on the right track and to mentor them. And we need to do more of that. But at the same time, we need to be careful not to think that we're gatekeepers of the faith of others as well. Guys, Let's not miss the point of true religion. And I'm using that term very purposely, re religion, because I know that sometimes sounds like a dirty word. We say, well, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. You know, it is a religion, but it is, it is the religion. It is the true religion that God has made for all of mankind. Um, and, and for those who are saved by God's grace, we're, we're that's the religion that that we're a part of, but don't miss the point of it. Don't become too comfortable that it becomes a distorted mess in your life um, so that you can, uh, you might as well join some other movement. No, no, let it point you to God. Let it point you to Jesus Christ and see him as Lord. So don't miss the point of true religion. Now, the second thing that we notice from this text, and I'm sure that there are many others, but the second thing that I notice anyway is do we understand the point of the Bible? Do we understand the point of God's law? Look at verses 2 and 5. These Pharisees come along and say, why are you doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? So what does Jesus do? He opens up the scriptures to them, and he says, haven't you read what David? Because David was one that they revered. David could do do no wrong by them, right? Haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? Now, he entered the house of God. Who's the only one who's allowed to enter the house of God? It's the priests, according to the law. But David entered the house of God, and he actually took and ate the sacred bread. Not only that, verse, uh, verse 4 says, but he even gave some to those who were with him, who weren't even the king, who weren't even a messiah of messiah status. You know, this would have really thrown these Pharisees for a loop because if they're really abiding by the law, well, man, David, he should have been put to death for going into God's house. But God rewarded David for actually doing something that was technically in violation of the law. They clearly didn't understand the purpose of the law, these Pharisees. Do we understand the point of God's word, of God's law? You know, we sometimes think that we understand the Bible, but we really miss the whole point. Oftentimes we come to the Bible thinking that, that you know what, if we obey its commands and we obey its rules and we do exactly what God says, then you know what, that's going to get us in good with God. These leaders thought that God's commands were the way to keep their salvation. And we can also think that. We can think that by adhering to God's religion, keeping the commands and, and doing all of the requirements, we can guarantee our salvation. But Jesus shakes up the notion of law-keeping for them. 
he shows them that the law really isn't about that at all. He shows them that the law was not, uh, it, it, was, it was made for man, not man for the law. And the case in point here is the Sabbath. The Sabbath, in fact, the whole law finds its fulfillment in Jesus. He says this in verse 5, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us, I think it's Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11 or 11 verse 7, it tells us that the law was made to be replaced by Jesus Christ. It was made to pass away once it was fulfilled ultimately in Jesus. David actually, in Jesus' example, David actually breaks the law. He is still considered righteous, but uh, which, which goes to show us that the law is not absolute. It is made to serve the purpose of Jesus. It is made to serve you and I. It's a pointer. In Galatians, it says that the law is a schoolmaster. The word there is pedagogos in, in the Greek. It means that it is a servant keeper of us to point us to something greater. It's not the ultimate. And so this rule keeping that we think is going to keep us in God's graces, that misses, again, it goes back to missing the whole point of God's religion. The law was made to pass away once it is fulfilled in Jesus. And if Jesus is in you, and if you're listening this morning, you're a Christian, he is in you, then you follow him. You've been set free, as the book of Romans, tell, Romans tells us, from that rule keeping. You've been set free from that Old Testament law. You're not under it anymore. This means that now there is no rule keeping that gains you more status with God. Now, that may be really bad news. For some of you listening this morning or maybe listening to this at a later date on YouTube, uh, it may be bad news for us who who have very little relationship with God, very little real relationship with God. And we think that all we have is our own rule keeping. You know, going to church, that's going to make you a good Christian. Yeah, making sure you give money to God, that's going to get you favor with him. And not drinking and not doing these other things and, and all of these kinds of things. Well, you know what? If that's what your relationship with God is based on, then what Jesus is saying here is bad news for you. But let it point you toward the good news. Listen, if you're, uh, if you're listening this morning and you're thinking that, uh, uh, that you keep up your relationship with God based on what you do, then there is good news for you. And the good news is that, is that he sets you free just by faith and trust in him because he is the one who has kept the law perfectly. If you feel like your sin is insurmountable, if you feel like you cannot be good enough to have salvation in God, well, two things. First of all, you're right. You can't be good enough to gain salvation with God. But the second thing is, is that Jesus is good enough. He overrides the law. He overrides that rule keeping. And he does it perfectly for you and me so that if you feel like your sin is insurmountable, if you feel like what you are mired down in, the sin that you struggle with um, is keeping you from God, the good news is that Jesus comes to lift that weight and he comes to deliver you. He says in this text, listen, this law it's, it's, it, it, I, I'm the Lord of this law and I set those who are in me free because I've kept it and my righteousness is on them. Guys, don't misunderstand the point of God's word. This is not just some rule book for you to struggle to abide by. Follow Christ and he will set you free, it set you free through his word. Don't miss the point of true religion like these Pharisees did. Take time to understand God's word, to understand what the law points us to. Yes, it points out our sin, but it points us to the Savior that can save us from that sin. Now, live your life as a Christian. Live it in freedom. Live it with a mission and a purpose that's, that, that is far superior to any of these other movements that we can become caught up in and live for Christ. Take that message, share it with the world, and watch God work in your life, 
Watch God work in the lives of others that you share the gospel with. Guys, this is what God has tasked us with. And if we really understand what our Savior, Jesus Christ, is all about, then we will have all boldness, we'll have all confidence to go and speak and testify to him and be used by him. And you will live in freedom. And we may live in a difficult world and a world where, yeah, those fears, they'll still creep in from time to time. But you know what? God is on his throne and you'll know it. Listen, I hope and pray that you've been blessed this morning as we've taken time to consider what God said to us, first in Psalm chapter 2, but then also in Luke chapter 6. Let's live for him now in freedom. Let's live for him knowing and trusting in his sovereignty that he is on his throne. Well, a couple of things I want to remind you of real quickly. The first is, um, I what are they here? I, um, churches are starting to get back. Um, so check out if your church is meeting this Sunday. If your church is meeting, I want to urge you to get back out to church. I know it may have been a while since you've been in church and it's kind of strange, but you need church. You need it. And uh, we need one another as Christians and God's given us church as a blessing. So check out if your church is open. And if it is, then get out there on Sunday. If you're from San Juan Baptist Church, um, I want to remind you of the website. I sent out an email. I'm going to send out another one. Actually, you can see it there on my Facebook too. If you go down in your Facebook feed, uh, let us know if you're coming by going to that website, reopen.church. And, uh, and just so that we can plan things a, a little better, logistically speaking, um, so that we know who's coming and, and, uh, and where to put people so that we can still try and be in compliance with a uh, government mandate, which is allowing us to worship. So praise God for that. But we just want to make sure that you do it the right way. But yeah, check out if your church is meeting on Sunday because you need your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and it, it is a blessing to be able to see them. Um, I, I can't think of anything else that I need to remind anything of. It is great to be with you again this morning, guys. So now go forth in, uh, in boldness. Go forth with the gospel. And uh, let's do what we were created to do and share the glory of God with the world. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this time of reflection. I thank you for the encouragement that I have with, with being with these brothers and sisters, even though it's through the internet, it's just such a blessing to me to see brothers and sisters that I know and that I love um, uh, spending time in your word with me this morning, Lord. Um, we pray that you would help us to remember and trust in your sovereignty, not fear the things of this world and not let those doubts and fears creep in, but, uh, but to uh, move forward in, in confidence that you're in control of things. And then also, Lord, help us to, uh, to just be faithful to what the word says, to really understand what our faith is about. For some of us, it may have been years since we felt the freedom that we first felt when we came to Christ. And I want to pray that if we have become too comfortable in our Christianity, well, that's not real Christianity. Christianity does not leave us comfortable, leaves us excited. Sometimes it makes us uh, examine ourselves. But Lord, if we've become too comfortable, I pray that you would shake us up, get us into your word, help us realize again the urgency of uh, of the gospel in our lives and for the lives of others and to uh, and to be set free once again from the constructs that we so often set up when it comes to faith free in Christ to do what you want us to do help us to be faithful servants of you living in freedom in Christ in Jesus name we pray amen God bless, and we'll either see you at church on Sunday or we'll see you maybe back here next Wednesday morning for the next quarantine devotional. God bless, guys.